For Crema Media in Johannesburg, I'm Sane Zamini. Ivan Johnson is in conversation with Polity about his memoir titled, but he speaks so well, Memoir of a South African Identity Crisis. Can you unpack the reasoning behind the title of this book? Because it's such an unusual title for a book, but he speaks so well. Did this contribute to your identity crisis? Yes, it, it does. And I'm sure lots of people of color would identify with it because I think we've all heard it at some stage, of, you know, um, but you speak so well. And um, it's kind of always dished out as a compliment, but it's actually quite, um, <laughs> quite a diss and <laughs> speaking down to you because, you know, it's always in the context of like, but you, you, you really made sense there and you're really quite good at what you do, but you, know, you, you say you're colored, but you speak so well. You know, it's like, what are you supposed to say? Like, so sorry for speaking so well, you know, um, because as colored or black people, you know, we have to speak in a certain way and not sound, I can say intellectual and intelligent. It feels like that. So but he said in jest though, because I take it quite lightly. Don't make too heavy of it. But yeah, I'm sure we've all heard that saying before. Can you tell us about your family when it was removed from the Cape Flats? And when you write about that story, you, it sounded as if you are not complaining, you are not too bitter at all. Can you tell us about that? I never experienced it myself because I was mm. born um, in Cork already where they'd already been moved, you know, from, um, from Weinberg and places like that and other families moved out just as sick. So it never affected me directly. And um, so I'm a Cape Flats boy, you know, and Crawford and then by Brave Estate for my, my childhood. This is not looking back and um, adding another narrative to it. It's about the way I saw life as I grew up. Okay, so I never grew up bitter. You were, and you may do with what you had. And what you had, you got used to that. So we weren't wanting for anything, always looking, oh, look, they have that. And it's so unfair that we don't have that because we weren't exposed to it. There wasn't even this TV, you know. And there was a reason why the government never wanted TV because they didn't want, us, they didn't want to show us stuff that we never had. Okay. <laughs> we could have had TV in the 60s, but they kept it away from us. So the whole, the whole story, you know, I'm, I'm not a... A struggle stalwart or um, an, or I wasn't an activist. I was just a kid growing up during apartheid and during the struggle and it did what kids do and if anything the struggle and the riots and all things was an adventure for us kids running around at night from one bonfire to the next burning tire you know throwing stones at the at the defense force and things like that it was just you know normal part of growing up and it was a big adventure for us. So only later did it come the whole fitness and the, you know trying to question and, and what was happening yeah and in the book there is a part where you talk about uh, your aspirations that you you wanted to get a job at coca-cola and be the finest writer the western cape had ever seen and it started with you now having to convince your father that you wanted to do that national diploma in in graphic design can you tell us about that and why graphic design i was really good at art throughout school although we didn't have a specific um, um, subjects related to art in any way. I didn't go to one of those schools. Um, my artistic skills were really defacing or, um, yeah, in my textbooks and drawing. Everyone said, like, you draw so well, you know. And I had one mention in primary school throughout my entire primary, I think we had one newsletter. And I was mentioned as one of three kids who was talented at art. <laughs> and I went on that. <laughs> so when it came to matric, I went through some sort of things, you know, losing love and quite a traumatic time and I was inherently lazy at school and so both my older sisters were teachers and the view was always that I'd go to you training college as well and, and, and study teaching and become a teacher but my, my mark was going to be good enough even for that so I wasn't going to university sure um, I wasn't going to go to training teacher training college and I thought well I'm kind of good at art so I went through subjects at a Technicon and I saw like graphic design and I saw six of the subjects were practical and only two were theoretical. I thought like that's the one for lazy Ivan so I'm going to do that. I had no idea um, what it entailed. I never knew that advertising was a vocation or a career. I just thought like well I've seen posters so I guess graphic designers design just for the backs of theatre or paint those Coca-Cola signs. I thought yeah I could possibly aspire to be a really good 
sign writer <laughs> for Coca-Cola. And that's, that's when only later they'll find out about advertising. And, and in the book, I liked the parts where you speak about your lecturers and uh, you mentioned that your first meaningful interaction with white people in general, you say that it was disappointing and at the same time rewarding. Can you unpack what you mean by that? Well, because you expect so much. I've never been exposed to it because at first you arrive there or, you know, and, and forget about everything else happening around us. You know, these are white oaks and they're, they're so cool. My goodness. And you're like, yeah, you want to impress them, you know, and that's the way we've been brought up. As we got to know them, I realized that they're just humans too. And, you know, they have faults too and, and lack in lots of things too. And it's not just a, a, a color thing. We shouldn't just be judged on the color thing, but on our being and what we have to, to, to offer. And some people have more to offer no matter what color they have. Yeah, it was, it was amazing. And I did take out a lot. It was, I learned a lot. And especially from, from one who I thought was a judgmental lecturer, but actually wasn't. And all he cared about was the work and our skills. Yeah, he couldn't be cared about where you came from, whether they are from Mumre, up from the Northern Cape, whether from Mitchell's Plain, whether from Crawford, whether from Bishop's Court. It didn't matter. It was about the work and your craft and, and getting better at it. So, yeah, there were two sides to the coin, but they all offered different things, some good and some bad. You've also achieved so many accolades, including the score, scores of Lori Awards. How does this make you feel now as a young man who was raised from humble beginnings? The way my dad brought up, we were, I was never ambitious. I lacked ambition. It was just like, just work hard, impress your bosses, show loyalty. Yeah, <laughs> we, didn't, we didn't reach for the stars at all. So I took my time learning my skills, learning my crafts and uh, never asked for increases even. You know, I thought that's kind of like disrespectful. And, uh, but you know, slowly moved up in the rank because of the work I put in. You know, I never asked for it. I never wanted to be a creative director. I enjoyed doing the work, which I still do. You know, I moved through those ranks and slowly started being recognized for my work and then winning awards, you know, Louis awards and awards all over the world. And then um, because of that, being invited to um, judge the awards that I was entering, you know, all over the world, whether it's in um, Miami or New York or London or Dubai uh, or Paris or um, the Clio's in um, Santa Fe. So yeah, it all came along with it. But I mean, that was a very special time. I really enjoyed it, seeing the world and being taken everywhere at their costs. <laughs> it was amazing. So yeah, and it was very inspiring. But you know, um, advertising is a very creative industry, as you know, but we can't always be as creative as we like to right now because a lot of times it's kind of like appeal to the lowest common denominator. So I don't think it's as creative. Maybe we need to be more creative to kind of cross that threshold and to, to do great advertising again. But that's why I started writing. I needed another release for creativity. And that was a nice way where no one else was over looking over my shoulder. I didn't have to appease everyone. I could write what I wanted to write and bring my story across the way I wanted to. And, and so far from those who've read the book, how has the response been? What is their feedback about this amazing book? Everyone enjoys it. I think they were quite surprised as, as quite entertaining because they mm -hmm. expected like a, a, the heavy story, a typical, oh, here we go, colored talking about the tough life growing up. You know, and then we did this and then we used to play games, I guess, and we used to play games. Sure, there's a lot of that in there. And some people have said like, you know, it's so entertaining, it reads like a movie. You should make a movie. And the funny thing is, when I started writing the book, it was very much like growing up in a colored neighborhood. This is what we used to do. This is what you do in like an extended diary. You know, and I thought like, that's a bit boring. But I, I stopped for various reasons because the book kind of took turns and, and all sorts of things. And at one stage, a lot of years into writing the book, I, I changed tact and I was very interested in, in movie scripts. Read up about it, I thought that's quite interesting. I'm going to try writing a movie script just for myself, just for fun, because a whole different formatting exercise which you had to get used to and I thought like I'm actually going to start writing the book as a movie you know which I did the thing about a movie it has to have a good structure and a good narrative it needs a beginning and it needs an end and it needs twists and plots and things and different characters within you know it needs to be quite entertaining you can't just have the sequential sort of diary this is what happened this is what happened and then I died <laughs> so the movie had to be kind of entertaining and then when I finished writing the movie script the screenplay, I thought like, well, I'm never going to enter this for like a movie because we'd want to do a movie and it was way too long anyway. 
I thought, let's start rewriting the book based on this structure, because way more entertaining. And that's when I went back and actually wrote the book. So it's because right. of the movie script idea that I had to keep keep it clean and gross and not be so indulgent, just like, oh, my life was so important and what everything I do was so important. There's lots of questions and what you're following a character going from scenario to scenario in different places and different people. And with that intention, because of the movie script really helped with that. There is a part, I think it's chapter 21, where you talk about um, your graduation uh, as a dead child at home. And you sort of pay tribute now to your father. And you also say that you, are, you have hurt him deeply. Why do you feel that way? Well, because, you know, when I went to my tertiary education, it was very expensive because I wasn't getting a bursary like my sisters had gotten to go to training college to teach training college. And my dad had to pay for it. And it was a lot of money for him. I think it was something like 300 Rand per year <laughs> or something. It was, it was quite ridiculous, but it was everything he had, you know, and uh, passed and, and eventually came to graduation. And for some strange thing, they didn't make a big deal about the graduation at the Technicon, or I thought they didn't. So I didn't even bother going, you know, for the whole hat and, and things and just didn't go. My dad found out like, what? You, you didn't go to the graduation. And that was his big moment you know, to see all his hard work pay off that I was, I graduated and I was so flippant about it. I just brushed it off. Ah, it's not important to me, didn't tell him about it. And that like in, in retrospect really broke my heart. It's like, you know, everything he's put in and consider we've been through so much trauma as a family already, you know, by then I'd lost my mom just then and my sister a few years earlier. And he was re probably really looking forward to it. And I was really disappointed. I was so flippant about it and didn't acknowledge, um, him and uh, my graduation uh, and didn't realize how important it actually was. And lastly, if I may ask uh, Ivan, what do you hope readers will take away after reading this book? You know, a lot of it is, is, is for other people. You know, I didn't want to write a book for, for, for colored people from that area and only identify with them. And it's not just about uh, reminiscing. Oh, those fun times. Oh, remember that. Oh, remember when we used to do that. I want to make it a broader story. That's why, you know, the, the Trovis travels all through Cape Town, different areas, different people, up country to Europe and all sorts of things, because it's about all sorts of different people and how we interact with each other. And it's about identity, because I struggled because of that reason, because I travel and mingle with so many different people. It's just that we all have our identity and we can't just be identified on the color of our skin. There's a whole lot more to us, you know, because the moment we become tribal, that's when bad things happen. The moment people start grouping each other, that's when we start finding problems with other groups. Yeah, even neighbors, you know, this little cluster of neighbors business. So it's not just a color thing, but the moment we go to groups, it's a very dangerous thing. And I think the only group, and I think, you know, not to give too much at the end, the only group that really, really means something that you really should sacrifice for um, is family. Yeah, the ones closest to us. And that's fine to have disagreements between us because we're all different, but you're still family. You belong in spite of it, yeah? You can be different, you know? Um, like I said, in our broader family, we all have different colors, all different hues and shades and hair and eyes, you know, from white to the darkest skin won every game of you know, hide and seek at night, <laughs> you know? We're very diverse, and but family is family. And you cannot, you know, kind of push family aside because of different views. That's a great thing, because you're still blood relatives and you must look after each other no matter how different you are. There was Ivan Johnson in conversation with Polity about his memoir titled, but he speaks so well, Memoir of a South African Identity Crisis.